domain omega that's also time dependent. So we have the usual incompressible navier stokes equation, but equations, but the domain changes with time. And hopefully I will be able to explain to you how did I get this video that you already saw. It's also on the gallery side of MFAM. So it's a turbine where we have an inlet on the left, an outlet at the bottom right. We have a parabolic inflow and we have a turbine that can rotate freely. And as you can see, after a little time, it starts to rotate with a relative constant rotational velocity. So that's the end goal, but there is a path to get there. So first I have to talk a few words about just time dependent Navier-Stokes equations. It's semi easy if your domain is fixed because you can do a semi discretization. You can rewrite this problem into ODE using your favorite spatial method, finite element, stabilized finite element, finite differences, whatever is your poison. And then you can use your favorite time stepping method, the explicit implicit Euler, BDF, Runge-Kutta, or anything else. Now, if you want to do a parallelization, you are more or less restricted by this time stepping. If you want to get something better out of it, you also may want to look at space time because I'll explain later, you can do a better parallelization in space time than in the regular time stepping approach. So how does the regular approach works when you have a fixed domain? For the simplicity, let me have just a one dimensional spatial domain horizontally and time goes up vertically. So you choose your discrete mesh points in space, you rewrite the problem into an ODE problem. So you have now an ODE system defined along the red lines, and then you take your time stepping method and get your solution at the grid points at different time levels. So this is, we all know this, this is method of lines. Now, what happens if your domain starts to move? So what happens if your domain is this black region I have that moves left, right? Suddenly method of lines is out of the question. You can even see that lines go in and out of the domain. So you need something else. That something else can be ALE, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian approach, in which you transform back to a fixed domain and do many of your calculations on the fixed domain. When people talk about AO, they say that the, one of the big advantages is that legacy codes can handle it with very slight modifications. Now, I want to talk about space-time. Space-time handles it completely differently. It transforms the problem to a one higher dimensional problem. So if you have a two-dimensional spatial problem plus time, we transform it into a three-dimensional problem. If you have a three-dimensional spatial problem plus time, we transform it into a 4D code. One of the big advantage is that you can obtain arbitrary high order both in space and in time. It's just quotation mark, a finite element method. So all you have to do is increase the polynomial order in the finite element discretization. And one thing that people like to say about space-time is that it satisfies the geometric conservation law. Now, what I want to add to it is that legacy codes can handle it. I'm really happy we are online, so no one can throw tomatoes at me, because legacy codes can handle it if they can handle matrix diffusion. Now, that's not the worst part, but if you want to solve a three-dimensional spatial problem, using space-time, you need four-dimensional meshes. If you only have a two-dimensional problem plus time, it's 3D, that's okay. 4D meshes, that's a more delicate subject. So as applications, you can think about moving domains in bioengineering, aerospace engineering, civil engineering. So I just have a couple of applications here that you can think about, blood flow, airplanes, wind turbines, blades, car wheels, or even free surface problems where the domain moves because it's part of the solution. And they just have some motivational pictures where you have different things and you can see that rotation is sort of an important part of my motivation. And it was an important part of the video I showed you at the beginning. 
So how does this space-time approach works? The idea is that we use upending in time. So again, same plot as before, just for the sake of simplicity, I have a one-dimensional spatial problem. I could have a 2D spatial problem, but then the plot would be more complicated. So you start with your initial mesh at time t0, and you have your initial condition u0. You figure out how the mesh mo nodes move at the time level t1. It can be part of the solution. It can be given a priori. One way or another, you figure out how the mesh moves. No, mesh nodes move, and then you connect those two and create a space-time slab. And then you mesh that space-time slab, so you get this green mesh here. I could have used quadrilaterals. For some reason, I decided to use simplices. It, at this point, it doesn't really matter. So now we have this two-dimensional problem in one slab between T0 and T1. So from the initial condition, I can solve it and get the solution inside the entire green region. And then I can project it to the top of that slab and get the solution at time T1. And then I can do the same figure out how the mesh nodes move at time level T2. Again, create just that one single layer of white elements and solve the problem. And then I can project the solution to the top of that slab, get the solution at time T2, and move on, do it for the third slab. And in the end, we get the solution U at time t3, and as a side effect, you get the Hungarian flag here with the three slabs. But keep in mind that in my approach, I solved the slabs one by one. So first I solved the green, then the white, then the red part. What I said earlier that you can get better parallelization is that if you know the movement of the domain, you could mesh the entire space-time domain before the calculation and solve the entire problem in one shot. So in that case, you don't even need these horizontal time levels T1 and T2. You can have arbitrary mesh elements there, and you can have locally smaller or bigger time steps. The reason I keep, I stick with this slab by slab approach is that I want to be, deal with fluid structure, fluid rigid body interaction. So if you do this slab by slab approach a little bit more precisely, we can write it into a little algorithm. You start with the initial condition, then you mesh the domain at the bottom of the slab at time ti and at time ti plus one as well. You figure out how the nodes move and then connect the two and create a mesh inside the slab. So yes, we need a higher dimensional mesh, but just one layer of mesh elements. So it's not a full blown higher dimensional mesh generation problem. And then you can solve inside the slab, project to the top of the slab and use that as an initial condition. So we are using upending in time and all we need is the solution U from the previous time slab. Now, let me get a little bit more mathematical. So I will have a mesh at the bottom of the slab, a mesh at the top of the slab. The spatial mesh elements I will denote by straight K, both at the lower level and at the upper level. Now, if you connect them, you create the space-time elements. I will denote them by these curly K notations. And if you look at those space-time elements, we have three different types of boundaries. Some boundary elements will be mesh elements on the lower level or mesh elements on the upper level, so the straight K elements, or there are some faces that go in between the time slabs. So I will denote those boundary faces by curly Q. The curly cube will be very important because we are going to have the fluxes defined differently inside the slab as on the top and the bottom of the slab. And also another important thing is that I have this normal here. 
this normal has two components, the spatial component denoted by n bar and the temporal component. Altogether, this vector has a unique length, but the spatial component on its own does not have a unit length, which may be something you have to take care of later. So the question is, how do we discretize within the slab? We can use the simplest possible option, use a continuous Galerkin approximation. It's based on the weak form. We know a lot about it. Most importantly, we know that it doesn't work well for advection-dominated problems. Okay, to fix that, we have a couple of options. We can use stabilized continuous Galerkin methods like SUPG. So we add some stabilization terms for the CG, and with that, we can get it work well for advection-dominated problems. But if you want to solve the Navier-Stokes problems, your discrete solution, without post-processing at least, will not provide a locally conservative solution. Okay, then we have another hurdle to overcome. So we can overcome that by using a discontinuous Galerkin discretization inside the slab. That works well for advection-dominated problem, can provide locally conservative solutions for Navier-Stokes, but we all know that it has an issue, namely we have a high number of unknowns because there is no shared unknowns between elements. And to overcome that, we can use a hybridization. So the hybridization, basic idea of hybridization is that instead of just the element unknowns that I denote by blue, for example, P1 triangular elements, I introduce additional facet unknowns on the interface between the two elements denoted by these green dots. And I define the fluxes between the facet unknowns and the element unknowns. And again, facet unknowns and element unknowns for the neighboring element. So there is no direct connection between the element unknowns, no direct connection between the blue degrees of freedom on one triangle and the blue degrees of freedom on the other element. I don't define the fluxes the usual way, but I define the fluxes using the facet unknowns. For the later slides, I will denote by u a function that lives inside the element and by u bar the functions that live on the facets. So what did I say? What was the problem with dg? Too high number of degrees of freedom. What did I do at this point? I introduced even more degrees of freedom by these green degrees of freedom along the interfaces. But I'll explain later that we can reduce the problem only to the facet unknowns. So we can use static condensation and solve the problem only for these green unknowns, green degrees of freedoms, and get the element degrees of freedoms in the post-processing step. So we actually can gain in the terms of number of degrees of freedom. Now, let me get a little bit even more precise and let me walk you through the space-time HDG discretization for a 1D advection diffusion problem. It's a very simple example, but it can highlight all the important decisions we need to make about hybridization. So let me consider a 1D advection diffusion problem you have the time derivative, you have the advection part, you have the diffusion part, and it's posed on a domain that's just one dimensional. I'm using some notations here, nabla x, instead of just using u prime. Again, here, nabla x, instead of just using u prime. I'm doing that so that you can see easily how to generalize it for higher dimension when that's actually the nabla operator. Now, what do we do? We rewrite the problem on this space-time domain, which contains all the spatial and temporal points, such that x is in the moving domain omega t. And I can combine the time derivative with the advective part into a two-dimensional advection diffusion problem. So now this nabla operator acts both in x and t, and this velocity, this advection velocity a is a bar and one. 
because the temporal derivative had a one in front. Now I can do something similar. That's why I said that legacy codes can handle space time. I can do something similar for the diffusion part. Instead of this diffusion coefficient, I can introduce a matrix version of it that I denoted with tilde that has a diffusion coefficient in first row first entry because that's space, but there is no diffusion in time. So that's how I can do it. Of course, there are nicer ways when you try to code it or when you try to talk about it. But as a first approach, this can actually emphasize how does this relate to the regular problem? What did I mean by legacy codes can handle it? And then we define finite element spaces on one single slab. So between time Tn and time Tn plus one, just like I showed it on the previous slide. So we have polynomials of degree K on the elements and polynomials of degree K on the facets. Let me separate the problem and let me first tell you what do we do with the direction. Well, the start is very standard. You multiply with a test function, apply integration by parts, and sum over all the elements. So we multiply by V with the integration by parts, and on the boundary, we have a flux term. So we have this flux term that we need to figure out. But before we do that, we need to take a look how the space-time normal look like on different parts of the boundary of a space-time element. If we are on a boundary that's on the top time level, then the spatial component of the normal is zero, the time component is one. If we are on the lower part of the slab, then the spatial component of the normal is again zero, the temporal is negative one. So these two normals on the top and the bottom can be figured out easily. On these curly Q boundaries, the space-time normal is what it is. So there is no simplification there. There is a temporal part, there is a spatial part, and the spatial part on its own won't necessarily have unit lengths unless the edge is completely vertical. So we want to use an upwind flux for the attraction, which means that if a dot n is positive, then take the inside value, otherwise take the outside value. Now, since n is easy to calculate on the top and the bottom, so on straight k n plus one and straight k n, we can easily figure out what happens there. The space time attraction times the normal on the top gives you plus one. So we need the value from inside the slab uh at the bottom we need uh minus because the product will be negative and that uh minus is either the initial condition if you are in the very first slab or the solution from the previous slab in any later points in the calculation and on curly q as i said the normal is whatever it is so the product you can write it like this spatial part of the advection times spatial part of the normal plus temporal part of the normal. And you can write it into a formula where there is this parameter eta, which takes the value one or zero, depending whether it's an inflow or an outflow. And with this way of writing, we can guarantee that if a dot n is positive, we take the value from inside the space-time element, so u itself. If, on the other hand, a dot n is negative, then we will take the facet unknown u bar. So we don't take the solution from the neighboring element, we take the solution from the facet. And therefore we can rewrite this flux term as an integral on the top of the slab using the solution from inside the slab, minus the integral from the bottom of the slab involving the either the initial condition or the solution from the previous slab plus this upwinding term. But we introduced an additional unknown, namely this u bar unknown, the facet unknown. We need an equation for that, and that additional equation is there to guarantee the continuity of the numerical flux in the normal direction across the faces. If you want to write it as a formula, this is what you get. 
if you want to remember the meaning, just think about continuity of the normal of the numerical flux in the normal direction. So what can we do about the diffusion? Same story, integra multiply with the test function, integrate by parts, and then sum over all the elements. So you're going to have your usual nabla nabla term, but now it is multiplied with this matrix coefficient. And we have the boundary term, and we need a flux there. So we can do different fluxes. For most part of the talk later, for the Navier Stokes, we went with the hybridized interior penalty discontinuous Galerkin approach. So it's very similar to the hybrid, it's very similar to the interior penalty. We have the gradient of the solution plus a penalty term. But now the penalty term penalizes the jump between the element and the facet unknown. So not the element unknown and the neighboring element, but the element and the facet solution. So that's why we again don't have any connection between the element unknown from one element and from the neighboring element. And here we have a normal dot normal term. And this is where I said that you have to be careful about anything where you see a normal times normal. This entire flux becomes zero on the top and the bottom of the slab. There is no diffusion leaking through time. On the in-between faces, on those curly Q faces, you can see that this is a matrix. First row, first entry is the scalar diffusion coefficient. So if you use that approach, then this can be written as the diffusion coefficient times the spatial times or spatial part of the normal dotted against itself. But this is not necessarily one. So that's what I said. You have to be careful. That is not one unless the face is completely vertical. And then you can put these two parts together, what we had for attraction, what we had for diffusion. I tried to color code it. Everything you see in red came from the advection part. Everything you see in blue came from the diffusion part. And of course, we have slight modification of the flux equation because we had flux for the diffusive part that also had to be continuous in the normal direction along the faces. But we only have these hybrid unknowns over the curly Q boundaries. Let me just very briefly tell you why is it not a problem that we introduce additional degrees of freedom. So if you write this problem into a block system, denoting by capital U and U bar, the coefficient vectors of the element and the facet unknowns, you can see that A is a block diagonal matrix. There is no connection between element degrees of freedom that belong to different elements. So I can actually write A inverse and I can mean A inverse because that's something easy to calculate. I can plug it into the second equation and then I can realize that all I need to solve as a problem, linear problem is for U bar. So the sure complement equation. And then I can reconstruct U element-wise in a very simple post-processing step. And typically, the number of degrees of freedom is smaller for a hybridized approach than for a DG approach. So that's why the hybridization, even though initially introduces additional degrees of freedom, can actually help to reduce the size of the problem. Let me say a few words about the HDG branch we have on MFAM. So we have two codes, but they are both steady. On one hand, we have the HDG advection part, which solves the steady advection reaction problem. And we have the HDG Poisson example, which solves the Poisson problem, but it uses the hybridized version of the LDG flux originally introduced by Coburn, Perer, and Guillen, not the hybridized interior penalty. So it has the unknown for u and also for the gradient of u. So there are two different element unknowns and only one facet unknown. The integrators, if you check those two examples, 
add all the volume terms and all the facet term as a one-shot integrator. So there is an HDG advection domain integrator and an HDG advection interface integrator. Same goes for Parson. That adds all the matrix, all the terms to A, B, C, D. You can see that this does not really fit with the modular part of MFAN. We tried to make it more modular, where we had a little indicator whether that integrator is related to matrix A, B, C, or D. But then we realized that that gets really messy if you have a bigger problem. So already when you use the hybridized LDG flux, A on its own is a two by two block system. So altogether you have nine matrices, nine sub matrices. If you deal with the Navier Stokes, then both A, B, C, and D are two by two sub matrices. So suddenly you have 16 sub matrices and you can see very easily why this other approach gets out of hand very easily. The good point of the HDG bilinear form that's on this HDG branch is that you can extend it relatively easily for problems involving more finite element spaces. So advection uses one element unknown, one element finite element space, one interface space. Poisson uses two element space, one trace space. You can extend it for different cases like the Navier-Stokes where you have two, two, or fluid structure interaction when you have maybe even more than two element unknowns. The other thing that you might find surprising is the assembly that we do in this HDG branch. A regular DG assembly loops over all the elements, you calculate the volume integrals and loop over all the faces and calculate the face integrals and add the contribution to the two neighboring elements and then you have your system. The big advantage of this approach is that you loop over the faces only once and then calculate the contribution to the two neighbors. In the HDG assembly that we have, and also the very similar other function, reconstruction, we have a different setup. You loop over all the elements and calculate the volume integrals. Then you loop over all the faces of the element and calculate the contribution of the face integrals to the local matrices. And then you do the inverse, inverse of the local matrix C and either calculate the short complement and so of the system or just reconstruct the function itself. So we loop over all the interior faces twice, once for both sides, and there is a reason for that. If you want to calculate the sure complement locally and you don't want to do any unnecessary calculation and you don't want to store matrices A, B, and C, and this is the best way that you have. Yes, you loop over twice the elements, the, sorry, the interfaces, but you don't have to store everything from matrices A, B, C. So it's the age old question, do you want less storage or a faster algorithm? And a couple of issues and challenges that I wanted to mention. So when we started to work with facet spaces, for example, you try to calculate a norm in the regular way in MFAM, as far as we saw, everything happened over elements. So all the norm, norm calculations looped over the elements, not the faces. Same applied to grid functions. So every evaluation, were defined over element finite element spaces, not trace spaces. And a couple of things that we always feel we need to mention is that for space time, we only create the space time mesh once for the very first slab. And later, all we do is we move the nodes at the lower and the upper time level, unless denoted otherwise. So for the easy cases, all we do is have the uh, mesh created once and then just move the nodes. Also, the diffusion integrators are slightly modified, so we don't try to force the matrix coefficient down MFAM's throat, but we actually try to implement our integrator, integrators without that. And when it comes to mesh generation, hexahedral and wedge meshes are easy. You start from a 
quad mesh or a triangular mesh, and you can even use the extrude mini app to get one layer. If you want to work with tetrahedral space-time meshes, then you need to cut those wedge meshes, and it gets a little bit more technical, but it's still not very complicated to create a tetrahedral space-time slab out of the wedge element. So now, after all of this preparation, let's jump into the Navier-Stokes. What changes? Well, first thing is that we have velocity and pressure. So we all together have four spaces, element velocity and pressure, facet velocity and pressure. We use the same polynomial degree for all except the element pressure. The element pressure is one degree lower so that we satisfy the in-subcondition. Altogether, we have two facet unknowns now, element, uh, sorry, facet velocity and facet pressure. You can go the hybridized BG way when both spaces are from, both unknowns are from these spaces, so this continues across the faces. Or you can go embedded BG, which means that you use continuous facet variables for both the facet velocity and the facet pressure. Or you can start some mix and match approach and use the embedded hybridized DG, which means that we use continuous facet variables for the velocity, but still discontinuous facet variables for the pressure. And we all know basic math. There are two finite element spaces, U bar, P bar, and there are two options, continuous or discontinuous. So there should be a fourth option when the velocity is discontinuous and the pressure is continuous on the interfaces but we don't talk about that version no no because that's the least useful out of all of it so the discretization after i showed you the uh, 1d advection diffusion is very similar to that we have a viscous term which is again based on the hybridized ipdg discretization so you have the jump between the element and the facet unknown. And in this equation here, we coded both the, both equations for the, uh, sorry, including the continuity of the nor numerical flux in the normal direction is also encoded in these equations. For the pressure term, we used a standard hybridization but it's not completely standard because we use P bar on the facet. So we have pressure inside the element and pressure, pressure on the facet as two independent variables. The convection part is handled with a nonlinear upwinding. So again, on the top of the slab, we have the integrator, we have the terms U dot V. On the curly Q faces, we have a space-time upwinding, very similar to what we had before, but we don't have that on the top or the bottom of the slab. Top of the slab, we have the solution from inside. Bottom of the slab, we have the initial condition or the solution from the previous slab. So we have a nonlinear problem in every single slab, and we solve that nonlinear problem with a thicker iteration. Now we all together have three different methods. So we first published the space-time HDG approach, which gives you a divergence-free velocity that is also divergence-conforming, energy-stable discretization, and it's locally momentum-conserving, but it has a large number of degrees of freedom. Then a year later, we introduced the embedded DG, space-time embedded DG, that has a small number of degrees of freedom, but you lose the divergence conforming velocity. So the velocity is not continuous in the normal direction across elements, but it's at least fast to solve. And in the same paper, we introduced the embedded hybrid, which is the best of both worlds. It checks all the boxes and has significantly less degrees of freedom than HDG, more than the EDG, but you get all the box checked. And they work very nice when you have small domain deformation. So let me show you a couple more videos. We have a NACA 0012 
airfoil, which is pitching between 10 and 30 degrees of angle of attack. Background color is velocity magnitude, and you have the velocity error plot as well there. Or we can do something a little bit more interesting, which is a pitching and plunging airfoil. So the angle of attack changes between negative 10 and positive 10 degrees. And the up-down movement is half of the core length. And you can very nicely see detachment of vortices at the tailing and the leading edge of the airport. So all of that works very nice until we have small domain deformation. But I showed you the turbine example at the beginning. Turbine example is large domain deformation. If you don't do something, then your mesh will tangle up. What can you do if your mesh tangles up? You can remesh the domain. Now, there are a couple of drawbacks of it. Remeshing is expensive, and you have to project the solution from the old mesh to the new mesh. Now, it can be expensive, and it can lead to suboptimal rates. So we would like to avoid that. One way to avoid that is to use the advantage that we are using tetrahedral space-time mesh which allows us to connect spatial meshes that are different on the top and the bottom of the slab. And one approach is the edge flipping, which has been known in the literature for a long while. What we did with it, we created an approach where we can pre-compute the mesh element before the calculation and however much the rotation is, we don't need to create a new connectivity during the simulation, but we just use some pre-computed mesh elements. How does that work? I divide the domain into three parts. So this rectangle can rotate. The inner part in, will rotate with the object. The outer region outside of the red region will stay fixed. It never moves. In between the two, there is the red region, which is the sliding layer. So that's where I'm going to do edge flipping. And there is that green layer, buffer layer. That buffer layer rotates together with the inner region, but it allows us to use pre-computable meshes. So we can have a build your own mesh approach. Anytime in the simulation, you know the outer mesh, you know the rotating mesh over the inner region, and over the sliding and the buffer layer, you can just get a mesh number three or a mesh number two. We only will only have four different options for the sliding approach, edge flipping plus the regular basic version. So all you have to do is pick one of the five peak computed connectivity. The starting point is a mixed mesh where the sliding and the buffer layer consist of quadrilaterals. Now quadrilaterals can be cut into triangles along one of the two diagonals. So I either use the N1, N3 or the N2, N4 diagonal. And the key is that as the rotation happens, I will change that diagonal. Sometimes I'll use one diagonal, sometimes I'll use the other diagonal. If you want to create a tetrahedral space-time mesh and there is no edge flipping involved, then the key is that you can cut a wedge into three tetrahedral elements. So on the outside part, which stays fixed, you exactly have this problem. You have a wedge element and you cut that into three tetrahedral elements. Over the inner region where the Top and the bottom is not perfectly aligned due to the rotation. It's not a perfect prism, but I never actually need this prism. I only need the indices of the nodes to create the tetra, tetrahedral mesh. So if I do this, I can mesh the inner rotating region and the outer fixed region very easily. There is no edge flipping, so I can generate the tetrahedral mesh, and with a very careful numbering of the nodes, I can get this chainsaw pattern. Look at the outside of the rotating region. 
the diagonal cuts are in a chainsaw pattern. Same applies to the inside of the outer region. We have this chainsaw pattern of the diagonals where we cut the quad into two triangles. That's going to be very important when we want to actually create a conforming space-time mesh. When do we do any kind of edge flipping? Imagine that the picture on the left is the very bottom of the slab and the mesh rotates clockwise. So the entire buffer layer rotates. Therefore, the one side of the sliding layer will rotate, but the outside of the sliding layer will stay fixed. So it can happen that at the beginning of the rotation, at the bottom of the slab, we have some very nice triangulations. But at the top of the slab, if we weren't to do anything, we would have some very bad triangulations and we would have some very small angles. So it's a good idea. It seems to be a good idea to just flip the dashed diagonals. So instead of using the dashed diagonals in the middle picture, use the opposite dashed diagonals on the picture on the right. And we are never actually going to create this mesh in the middle. If we would get to that point, we are going to do an edge flipping. So now what we need to do is connect the mesh at the very left, that's going to be the bottom, and the mesh on the very right, which is going to be the top of the slab. So you now know what's the mesh at the bottom, what's the mesh at the top, and the connectivity is not exactly the same. For example, if you look here, I have the P7, P13 diagonal, but here I have the P6, P12 diagonal. And you may ask, why do I have those gray regions? Because we have something else. We have the chainsaw pattern on the inside and the chainsaw pattern on the outside. So from the previous picture, we have those chainsaw patterns. We know how the mesh has to look at the bottom of the slab and at the top of the slab. But we need to make sure that on the inside and the outside of the space-time slab, we have a matching, we have a Conforming mesh, so the chainsaw pattern we create matches these chainsaw patterns. Similar approach can be said if the rotation happens the opposite direction. In that case, we would switch the solid diagonals of the quadrilaterals. But it's very similar picture. So what do we have? We have a couple of building blocks. This is one of the building blocks on the sliding layer. What do I know? I know that I need to do an edge flipping. So the spatial mesh at the bottom and the top is not the same. The reason I needed the buffer layer is to handle the chainsaw pattern. So over the sliding block, I don't care about the chainsaw pattern. I forget it and I make the mesh on the outside of the slab of the annulus and the inside of the annulus to match, and all the other edges are free to choose. And we created a machine with which you can build up different building blocks, put them together, and they will perfectly cover the annulus and handle the edge flipping. So that's the option number one. And you also have the brother of it where you do the edge flipping in the opposite way. But as I said, on the sliding layer, the chainsaw patterns are completely ignored. I deal with the chainsaw pattern over the buffer layer. Now the chainsaw pattern on the outside and the inside either matches or not. If it matches, if the two chainsaw patterns match, I have the most boring vanilla mesh over the buffer layer, no edge flipping anywhere. If the two chainsaw patterns did not match, then I do another edge flipping, but not in the spatial part. Spatially, the meshes are exactly the same, but in the space-time slab itself, there is an edge flipping on the outside annulus and on the inside annulus to make sure that the two chains of patterns match. And this can be applied very nicely to some fluid rigid body interactions. So in case of fluid rigid body interactions, we have the Navier-Stokes equations, but now I wrote it with the symmetric gradient. We are going to solve these 
with the embedded hybrid DG. Then we couple it to some ODEs that describe either the vertical displacement or the rotation of the rigid body. So the source terms are the lifting force or the pitching moment force. They come from the fluid calculation. So the two problems are coupled and we solve this um, ODE with the predictor corrector approach where our corrector is a PDF2 discretization. So you have this letter D, which just describes the vertical motion and theta describes the angle of attack. So we have a staggered algorithm for that. First, we use a predictor step at time Tn to figure out the position of the rigid body at time Tn plus one. Then we create a mesh inside the slab and solve the fluid problem and then do a corrector step by calculating the forces on the top and use the BDF2 to check whether an update is necessary for the rigid body position or not. Has the rigid body position changed too much or not? If it did, then we create, we, we update the flow domain and the mesh and we solve again the problem until some sort of convergence in the rigid body movement is achieved. Once we have that, we can move on to the next slab. So first we tested this with the galloping rectangle, which you can find surprisingly a lot of different tests in the literature. So we have a rectangle with aspect ratio four. We have the sliding layer placed at distance five from the center of the or center of the rectangle. The position of this sliding layer is sort of arbitrary. You can place it very far from the object, or you can actually have it tight fitted to the object. What it will affect is the maximum time stepping you are allowed because you can only have one edge flipping. So you can order either flip all the edges into one way or the other, but that's all you can do. You cannot have too much of a rotation between the bottom and the toe if your mesh elements are very small. So that's the issue if you have it tight fitted around the rectangle. We ran simulations on different meshes, different time stepping, different polynomial orders, and we got the result plotted here. The maximum angle matches very nicely to what we see in the literature. And here is a little video. So it takes a little while for the rectangle to start to rotate. So after a while, you see some water shedding and then you start to see some little rotation. And then if you wait a little bit more, then you get nicely that uh, 0.25 radian. And once it reached that, you can just see a periodic oscillation as long as you let the simulation to go. So this was a validation for us to see that yes, everything is working and we get the same nice results as what you can find in the literature. Then we went to something that's more interesting, challenging, a fluttering bridge example. Think about the Tacoma narrow bridge accident. So you have an H shaped bridge in the middle that can rotate and move up and down. The rotation is handled very similarly as in the previous one. I have the sliding layer at distance 15 from the center of the bridge. The up-down movement is handled slightly differently. Every mesh node inside this smaller rectangle moves up and down with the bridge. Every mesh node outside of this bigger rectangle stays fixed and in between the two we decrease the vertical oscillation from the full oscillation to nothing. Again, multiple meshes, time stepping and polynomial orders. And we get that the maximum angle is between 0 0.9 and one radian. The maximum displacement is around 0 0.75. And it matches very nicely to what you see in the literature. Now here you have to wait a little longer. So you get the wind from the left, you already see some rotation, and then at some point you will see some oscillation 
vertically, but that's very small compared to the entire size of the, of the bridge. And then the angle just starts to increase. And after a while, you really don't want to be on that bridge. So let me run it a little bit further. We are getting very close to that entire one radian of rotation. And the rotation and the frequency actually is very small. So these rotations happen very, very fast. And again, after a while, it reaches a periodic movement. But again, here, the maximum angle is one radian. So the bridge does not overcome. So we went to one more example, one step further, where we have this turbine example I showed you at the beginning. So the inlet actually is much longer. It's just not shown on the picture. Also, the outlet is much longer. It's not shown on the picture. And as I showed you in the video at the beginning, the turbine performs multiple 360-degree rotations. And after a while, you see that the rotation, rotational velocity reaches a steady value. So initially, it rotates very slowly. But then after around an entire 360-degree rotation, it reaches its maximum velocity. And you can let the simulation go on and on, and you will see multiple 360-degree rotations. So you can find this animation also on the MFAM gallery page. Let me show you something that's not on MFAM's gallery page about this. Yes. So I have some videos posted on my website where you can see how the mesh changes. So this is the turbine, and you can see that the mesh on the inlet and on the outlet stays fixed. The connectivity is not changing around the turbine. The nodes move, but the connectivity doesn't change. The only place where connectivity changes is the sliding layer right next to the turbine housing. And the rotation is so fast that basically every uh, time slab, there is an edge flipping going on. And you can put this uh, video. This, this shows an entire 360-degree rotation. And you can see how the mesh reconnects. Let me show you the very similar video where we have the rotating uh, the, the rotating the galloping rectangle so you see the different uh, angles maximum 0 0.28 and then negative 0 0.28 and again you can see that the outside stays completely fixed the connectivity doesn't change over the rotating domain the only place where any connectivity changes is along the sliding layer So to conclude, I showed you that space-time HDG can work in MFAM, and it can be applied to fluid rigid body interactions. And we even created some sliding grid technique where you can use pre-built meshes. For the future, we would like to work on 3D problems, but yeah, they need for the meshes. And we would like to work on fluid structure interactions. And if you want to see more or see all the videos, they are all on my website, and I think these slides will be posted so you can see the link there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Why don't we uh, give our speaker a round of applause here, virtual, of course. I'm always, I, I, I'm, I'm always struck uh, by those, those visualizations. The uh, the the sliding you you could do a lot more with that sliding layer that I you know would, would initially have thought. Um, do, does anyone have any questions they want to bring up? Go ahead and unmute yourself, or just use the chat. But then I have to ask Aaron to check the chat because I don't see it.
Yeah, I can I can read stuff out of the chat. Uh, Brandon, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself or type something in chat? Okay, th thank you. Very very nice. I, uh, that that was uh, pretty convincing about the uh, the parallelization and what you could do with the the space time. So thanks for showing that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I just had uh, two two quick things. Which, which one is um I know you you had different. Uh, it wasn't the focus here, but you, you you didn't say much about the penalty about the stabilization parameter. I was just wondering how, um, you know, how difficult it was in general to find really to, to estimate it so that you have stability, but not too big. Is it, is it relatively insensitive in these problems or is it a thing you have to pay a lot of attention it's, to? It's, it's your usual IPDG problem. So the sensitivity is exactly the same. We stick with three times polynomial degree squared and that seems to be working very well. Okay, that's that's great that it's not then it's not that uh, you don't have to run it a lot of times. Just one other really quick thing was because I'm pretty new here. Uh, does um does MFM have uh, quadrature rules on on four simplices? Is that a, is that a thing you'd need to start doing? Uh... I mean, we would need for these simplices first. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. That's... There are some development branches as far as I saw. I don't know how far they are on the way to get it working. Okay. Yeah, 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 but uh, all right. Well, thank you. That was uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have one. It might be kind of naive, though. Go for it. I'm barely familiar with space time elements. Um, I guess I'm just wondering why. Um, why the treatment of large deformation is needed, uh, or, or why why mesh entanglement becomes worrisome. So there, there's some kind of like that you have the element conforming in the time in the in the time dimension, right? Can you relax that? Can you instead like have like I don't know advection in time? Does that make sense? Give me one second to bring up a plot that might help to understand your question. Namely here at the very beginning that I just lost. One sec. So here that what you're saying is that if the mesh at T1 coming from the bottom and from the top is not the same, there are people who do that. You have still an issue of if the mesh at the top of a slab and at the bottom of the slab is not the same you have to project the solution so you evaluate u1 x you get u1x as projecting the solution to the top of the first slab then in the second slab you use that as an initial condition and if it's not the same mesh you do need some sort of projection or some sort of uh, yeah some sort of projection of that mesh of that solution to the new mesh even though it's just in space but you do lose a little bit of uh, accuracy there. And it can be expensive if that's what you are asking. So I, I guess in part, it's a consequence of the, the approach of doing slabs as opposed to solving the entire space-time problem at once. Yes, the problem is that if you try to solve the entire problem at once for a fluid rigid body interaction or a fluid structure interaction, you don't know the movement. So I, I agree, if you know the movement, you can go ahead and solve everything in uh, from initial time to final time if you wish, but in fluid structure interaction, fluid rigid body or free surface problems, the domain is part of the solution. So there you can't really do that. Yeah, there, that's a that's a, a re that's an active research topic, but it's not a solved problem yeah. at this point. Okay, I understand, thank you. You're welcome.